Hello, everyone, and welcome to session number 17 of the Connected P online conference. 2017, absolute pleasure to welcome our first dual presentation, and it's coming to us from um, Kuwait and Kazakhstan, and none other than Scott and Callum are going to take us through CrossFit, their experiences, how they got it going um, when they're working together in Kuwait. So take it away, guys. Super excited. Okay. Well, hey, guys. Um, welcome to our webinar implementing CrossFit into the PE curriculum. Um, as Jared said, I'm Callum Erskine and I'll be hosting this alongside my friend and former colleague, Scott Tusco. Yes, indeed. Thanks for joining us, guys. We understand that you're most likely giving up your free time today to tune in and watch this, so we hope to make it as engaging and interactive as possible. Frequently asking you for your input through the use of poll questions and hope that we can provide you with the knowledge required to get your school started on the CrossFit journey. As a little tester, can I get you to type your name and where you're tuning in from, just to make sure you can see where that function is. You should see um, a chat box at the bottom of your screen, so go ahead and click on that and give us a quick hello. So we've seen some coming in, but yeah, just, yeah. just to Fire make sure away. Somebody... Scotland. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I know who that is. Yeah, okay, we know who on. that is. <laughs> <laughs> moving on to the next slide. Yeah. Texas, UAE. Oh, here we go, UAE, brilliant. Brussels. Fantastic, it's great to see um, where everyone's coming from. But before we get started, I think it's important to say that um, this presentation isn't solely talking about CrossFit, rather any strength and conditioning methodology involving functional movements that encourages students to move with consistent mechanics. So each school will have varying facilities and resources. Therefore, although we'll, we'll be using CrossFit as our chosen label, We'll be communicating the core values that we think can be applied to any strength and conditioning program within any school curriculum. So yeah, as already stated, my name is Callum. Um, I'm originally from Aberdeen, so I've seen some of these coming in from Scotland. Hopefully, they're from the dizzy North Heights. Um, I've been working abroad since 2011, originally for five years in Kuwait, where I worked alongside Scott, and I've recently moved on to Kazakhstan, where I'm the head of PE at Halebury Almaty. Uh, during my time in Kuwait, whilst holding the head of secondary PE at the British School of Kuwait, I also co-founded the first affiliated CrossFit program within a school in the Middle East, now running under the name of CrossFit BSK. And yeah, as we said, I'm Scott Fusco, also originally from Scotland, but grew up slightly further south in Edinburgh. As Callum mentioned, I've been part of CrossFit BSK since it began in 2014 leading the year 10 and year 11 year-long elective courses. In my current role as head of primary PE at BSK, I'm now working closely with coaches Andy, John and Sarah to develop what is already an exceptional program at BSK. We're both qualified CrossFit trainers and since 2012 we've been using CrossFit as our main form of fitness training, experiencing numerous CrossFit classes in different gyms or boxes all over the world. So during this session, we're going to try and avoid text-heavy slides, but forgive us for now as we feel it's really important that everyone is aware of what the aims of the session are. Um, we split the session into two sections, uh, what you need to know and what you need to do. Can I just add at this point, if you've got any extra questions or comments um, you need to make, just jump into the comment section and, and fire us a question. I've got it coming up live at the side of me here, so we'll try and answer them as we go through. This session is for you not for us, so we want to make it as, as useful as we possibly can. Um, we'll start by answering the question, what is CrossFit? Um, going on to share the core values that underpin functional fitness methodologies and outline the reasons why we believe the next generation should be experiencing this within their school curriculum. After dispelling the negative myths surrounding CrossFit, we will turn our attention to what you need to do, providing some example lessons, some scaling options, and other necessary steps in order to help you build CrossFit into your current curriculum. Yeah, as stated earlier, rather than just speaking at you for 45 minutes, we are inviting you to contribute your thoughts through the use of poll questions. These will be used to generate discussion and provide contrasting opinions or experiences on a particular topic. There will also be an opportunity for some practical involvement for those of you who are interested in that. We're interested in seeing the level of experience present today. So our first poll question is, how much CrossFit experience do you have as an athlete? Have you never heard of it before? Possibly you're just beginning. Um, to train through CrossFit or maybe you're an experienced CrossFitter. So if you can just go ahead and type your answers in the comment, comment box um, at the bottom, that would be great. As an athlete, um, Scott, how long have you been doing it? 
Um, I've been training since 2012. Uh, definition of athlete is very loose. I certainly just enjoy the training. Um, I don't think I'm going to make the games anytime soon. Let's put it that way. Okay, so we've got Lorna. She knows of it, but never actually done it. Never attended, but done a couple workout. Okay, good. I myself have probably done it. Oh, wow. Joe McGurk hoping to be in the team in this year's regionals. Yes, we know who you are, Joe McGurk. Yes. She's from Kuwait, guys, just in case you're wondering. Um, as me as an athlete, I've probably done it for, yeah, probably five years. But again, the word athlete might be um, a little generous. Okay, so from what we can see. So from me, uh, I, I can say that time in Kuwait. Um, yes. For sure. That was rough. <laughs> I took Jared okay. to a little workout um, there. That was good, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that, guys. Um, it's obvious we've got varying levels of experience, but I think we both agree that whilst having experience of doing CrossFit is helpful when delivering it within a lesson, it's certainly not essential. Having a solid grasp on the core values and necessary strategies to ensure safety will put you in a strong position to start using it within your lessons, and that's something that we're both going to aim to do today. So our second question is just then interlinked to that, really, as to how much CrossFit experience do you have as a teacher or a coach, have you ever tried this in any of your PE lessons? Or have you, are you a coach um, outside of school and have used stuff like this before? Um, again, just help us shed a little bit of light on this. Again, I've done CrossFit for five years, but as a coach, I probably only tried it for maybe three, three and a half years um, before I felt confident to try and do any of it with my students. And I know that John, uh, one of our current coaches at BSK, well, he promised me he was going to tune in. I'm not sure if he has, but... Um... He, he did say that he was going to be tuning in today and maybe we will have some of the, the people that are present at our Connected PE conference back in October that might be tuning in to see um, what we're talking about again today. But I think whatever your level of experience, we hope to add value to your current knowledge base today and we're going to be looking at things from an educational point of view. So even if you are a coach, you know, you should be able to add value to what you already know. So just seeing Will here has taught the AMRAP principle with students last week, that's um, really good that you've mentioned that because I can't remember if I really emphasize that later in the presentation. But AMRAP basically means as many rounds as possible. And I will now touch on that later on again because that's a really good point from, from Will. So thank you for reminding me. I'm making a star on my notes as we speak. Really useful thing to do. Um, so yeah, again, we've got like varying levels of experience of teaching and coaching it. Um, whilst this webinar is designed and maybe set up originally for beginners, it also will provide some of the experienced coaches with examples from within a school um, where conditions would likely differ from an adult CrossFit gym. So we believe there should be value here for everybody um, irrelevant of your current experience. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get into the what you need to know section. And the first thing here we're going to touch on is, well, what is CrossFit? Because as we've seen, some people um, have, have zero experience of it. So um, I think the graphic that should be coming up on the next slide um, taken from the CrossFit main website, describes it perfectly, in all honesty. Constantly varied functional movement performed at high intensity. A typical CrossFit session would include a variety of different movements, some of which are outlined on this slide here. The movements tend to fall under three categories. Olympic lifting movements, for example, clean and jerk, snatch, or versions of this, such as push press or front squat. Gymnastics or bodyweight movements, for example, push-ups, pull-ups, and hollow body holds. And lastly, monostructural metabolic conditioning or essentially cardio-based activities such as running, rowing, and cycling. I think the key thing to take from this is that the movements are functional, ones that we use in everyday life and that can develop our overall fitness. In CrossFit, we don't use as many machines as we would in traditional gyms. Rather, the body is used as a machine, developing movements that can benefit the quality of life of individuals from a young age all the way through into their elderly years. The quote that we've been running with uh, recently is, we don't use machines, we build them. And the kids obviously seem to know that. If we move to the next slide and look at the top row of photos, um, it's very evident the progression made in telephone communication over the years. And when comparing this obvious progression to the current fitness methodologies being delivered within our school systems, we feel that collectively as providers of education that we may have possibly fallen behind. It would seem that we are stuck in a ways when it comes to providing effective fitness education to our students. Why are perfectly spacious fitness suites being filled with expensive gym equipment that focuses on developing isolated muscles? 
when the space could better be used to develop functional compound movements that would better prepare students for the physical demands of our modern day life. So our third poll question is, um, is linked to maybe the scenario that you currently have in your school. So what fitness facilities or resources do you have available right now? Do you have a dedicated fitness suite or fitness room? And is it to your liking? Um, that would be really interesting for us to know. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a good question. Before uh, moving abroad to Kuwait, I worked at a newly built school in Scotland. And as they built it, they put a massive investment into the sports facilities, including a purpose-built fitness suite. However, in my opinion, it was unfortunate the, the decision was made to fill it with treadmills, cross trainers, and isolated weight training machines, as opposed to what we just discussed, the more functional equipment that would have been better suited to teach a class of 25 plus students. So I frequently found myself relocating my fitness lessons into the games hall, and I just thought that, that was a shame that they put that amount of money into it, um, and it could have been used far better. Yeah, the money side of the thing is, is, is right on, isn't it? Like, um, treadmills aren't cheap. <laughs> And yeah. it's, it's, not, it's just such a simplistic range of motion that it forces people down. So interesting things coming in here. Lorna has got a tiny fitness room that's very old. Well, Lorna, I hope that we can give you some things that we can help you with uh, today to make that room a little bit more usable. Tends you across the like fitness center is machines. So, and Oliver's got no fitness facility. I'm assuming, Oliver, if you're a teacher, you've maybe got a space, an open space, however. And again, hopefully we can shed some light as to how to maybe make the most of that, um, that in your school. Okay, some really interesting stuff there. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, yeah, so again, we've got some... We found that sometimes schools, particularly my experience working in the private sector um, abroad, that schools are happy to pay for expensive machines to fill the space and are hesitant to free up that space, again, having made that investment. Um, and therefore, you know, it, it doesn't really allow for functional movements that kind of very restricting what you can do with certain machines. Um, at this stage, it's probably worth mentioning that you might um, encounter large amounts of resistance when introducing CrossFit in your schools, possibly a an administration member who doesn't fully understand the benefits or is just downright against CrossFit um, based on their first impression when looking at the, the things that come up on Google when they search for it. And um, we'll discuss this a little bit more in detail later, but either way, it's important to be resilient and be prepared to, to back up your own opinion with evidence, which again, we'll hopefully be able to help you with. Okay, we're going to go ahead and look at, well, why CrossFit? Why are we building this into the curriculum? What are the benefits of it? And in terms, of, in terms of helping justify adding CrossFit into your PE curriculum, we have a very simple graphic to help outline this. Well, first of all, it's broad. It underpins a lot of the key movements and aspects of sport and, and activities that will be in your PE curriculum. Introducing this in the lower end of your school will really allow for students to develop well in a whole variety of activities as they move through the system. It's also inclusive. We'll touch on it more later, but there is a huge opportunity to have all students competing in the same class and the same workout, but moving with alternative outputs. Finally, and most importantly, it's fun. We aim to pair fitness with fun so that students enjoy the journey and look forward to it. Yeah, um, this quote here from the, uh, taken from the CrossFit Kids website, hopefully summarizes what it aims to do. So based on the mechanics, sort of based on the principle of mechanics, consistency, and then intensity, CrossFit Kids emphasizes that emphasizes good movement through childhood and adolescence. Consistently good mechanics translates to physical literacy, enhanced sports performance, and fewer injuries for kids. Um, just in order to emphasize this further, we've got this graphic here, um, and it's obviously in the shape of a pyramid. And again, it's just based upon the principles of CrossFit. So before adding weight or speed to movements, you need to have a secure base. Um, the mechanics of, of the movement need to be drilled no matter the level, even people at the high end of strength and conditioning should always be dialing in their form and movement patterns. And once this has been mastered, at least relative to that particular athlete or student, the next aspect is consistency. Being able to show the movement repeatedly, but maintaining the movement patterns shown early, earlier, particularly if they're tired, you know, maybe part of the way through a workout. Uh, and finally, once this has been achieved, you can add intensity. So intensity comes in the form of more repetitions, bigger loads, i.e. heavier weights, or increased speed. Um, however, this should never be added, obviously, until the base of the pyramid is, is more secure. Uh, another analogy from a guy called Julian Pinau, 
of strong fit if you've never heard of him i highly recommend you check out some of his podcasts and, and vlogs on youtube um, or just type in strong fit and you'll find some stuff really really intellectual guy some of his methodologies and understanding come from this thing about a box and it says the bigger the box the more you can put in it uh, is of course, I did last summer cover the ways in which you can make your box personally bigger, um, i.e. like the base of this pyramid. But if you try to do too much too soon, then the box obviously becomes unstable. And it's exactly the same with the pyramid. If you put too much onus on intensity, i.e. giving kids heavier weights that they can't handle to move with as well, then that pyramid becomes top heavy and, and, and likely to come down. Um, the beauty of CrossFit is, and it's one thing that has provided a really good education to the fitness community, and lots of that is free on the internet, um, is how to make movements accessible for all athletes irrelevant of their background or fitness levels. So they, they call this scaling, um, the ability to make a movement slightly easier, but still meet the standards of that movement. And in teacher language, some of you would call this differentiation, which makes these fitness lessons absolutely fantastic um, within your school. So here's an example in this video of the push-up. Um, I'll just play it and let it load forward a little bit. Um, and basically, in this is one of the most stock body weight movements out there, but you'll find that a lot of your students actually struggle with this movement because they don't possess the upper body strength to do it. Um, I'm going to skip the video a little bit forward because just at the start here, it outlines what a full push-up looks like. But later on, if I can get to it just here, um, the video highlights some of the a variation that you could make um, to make that a bit easier. So for me, that is like a really good example of how you can scale a push-up. My only issue with that video is the fact that they have a female doing the push-up and it's always labeled that a female is going to be the one who needs to do a push-up from their knees. It's a bit of a stereotype, um, which is not one that I believe in. <laughs> um, here, you can see though that this, this would be something that you could do in your class. It doesn't have to be a box. Obviously, this is a CrossFit gym. It has this, the, the facility available to do that. This could be done with a bench, could be done with a chair, and it just gives students that ability to make the movement a little bit easier, whether that be a male or a female. Okay, um, next we're going to put you guys on the spot here. Now we're going to offer an example scenario that could happen in any of your PE classes if we're in a perfect world and you only had 15 kids in your class to start with and 12 of them were moving perfectly. Those three students were not moving well what skills could you offer them? And we're doing this through the squat movement, which is outlined on the slide. If you have any suggestions, can you go ahead and put them in the comment box now, please? Yeah, I mean, the squat is a very, very hard movement, but it's also one that a lot of people will try and put into their fitness classes. Um, and there are loads and loads of ways of scaling this. So I'm going to be very interested to see if anybody's got some ideas. And I will tell you, it would be a miracle, an absolute miracle, if, um, if 12 of your group could do the squat perfectly from the word go, because in my time that hasn't, hasn't happened. What, Callum, what are some of the issues that you've experienced when you've taught the squat? Um, generally, the first one is, is people not necessarily maybe understanding how, how low the squat should be, but obviously if they go so low, we don't want them to be compromising their position. A lot of students maybe don't have the mobility to, to get themselves, like in the, in the picture on the slide here, to get into that position at the bottom with not bringing their heels up. So a lot of kids can get down there, but um, as a result, they bring their heels up and that puts a lot of unnecessary pressure onto their knees. So we want to be in that bottom position, but maintaining um, a flat foot. So we've got 
ball on the back spot against the wall. We've got a bench. We've got a box and chair. Okay. Were you ready to reveal, Scott? Yes, and yeah, that's that's go ahead. So, so linking back to the pyramid, the key is mechanics, and I know a few of you have come up with these suggestions, so that's great. But um, this comes before addressing the range of motion. And what we mean by that is, while we would love all students to be able to squat below parallel, i.e., getting their pockets below their knees, it doesn't always allow for a good quality of squat, like what Callum was talking about. In order to ensure all other mechanical parts of the movement are sound, we should support certain aspects of the movement. All examples here do this, and I'm pleased to see that some of you guys have outlined these already, so you're obviously um, working well with whichever fitness uh, methodology you're using at the moment. Um, the example with the plates and the ball is a personal favourite of myself and Callum's, as it takes up least space, has small targets to work on, and if they show better mechanics, take away one plate, then another, and then eventually take away the ball, and they're performing the full movement. Yeah, and I just want to draw your attention to like the chair. I put the chair one in on purpose because a lot of people will say, oh, I don't have the medicine ball, I don't have the plates, I don't have the perfectly nice CrossFit box either, but I'm sure everybody will have a chair available somewhere in the school. And again, it's just a really good, um, really good option to allow students to understand um, how low they can go. Yeah, we're now going to go ahead and look at the spell and the myth. Now, I've noticed that well commented that he has PE colleagues, colleagues who aren't a fan of CrossFit. Um, and this is, this is normal. There's a lot of people that um, are possibly put off by CrossFit. So we're going to touch on that now. Um, it's, it's commonly held that CrossFit is dangerous, but we're hopefully going to go through and make sure that this is not the case. In our experience, schools are very quick to dismiss a new fitness program, especially if free weights or weighted objects are involved, based on the popular belief that it's dangerous to their students. And whilst we understand that they are ultimately acting in the best interests of their students, we also feel that some of the more discreet dangers are ignored and almost become commonplace. Examples of this are evident when students are asked to sit down for the duration of every lesson, as well as being expected to carry up to 15 kilograms of books, folders and resources in a bag on their back throughout the entire school day. A weight that would take some time for students to work towards during a CrossFit block. We'll cover this topic in more detail now. When discussing CrossFit with someone who has not been to a class before, I often hear the following quote. I read that CrossFit causes injuries and I've watched it online and it looks dangerous. Unfortunately, this is a view that many share as they have read a particular article online or watched a certain video on YouTube and then their mind is made up and they will instantly dismiss it from that point onwards. At this point, it is important to outline the differences between CrossFit as a training methodology and CrossFit as a sport. When searching CrossFit online, it's likely that the first thing that you'll come up, uh, sorry, come across is footage from the CrossFit Games. These athletes involved in this are full-time CrossFit athletes who train three or four times a day. They have trained for years to be in a position to earn a living through their CrossFit competitions and are therefore able to push their bodies to the limits, performing complex movements that to any ordinary observer would seem dangerous. They are involved in high-stakes competition where they are pushing their bodies further than they ever have before. So naturally, there are times when athletes get injured. This is in complete contrast to the environment that one would hope to create within a CrossFit lesson. Just like a Premier League football match would differ greatly to a Year 5 football passing lesson, the same could be said for a CrossFit lesson covering the burpee movement. As teachers, it is our role to create a comfortable and safe learning environment for our students. If we are able to do this through other activities such as basketball, swimming and gymnastics, then there is no reason why we cannot continue to do this through CrossFit. Yeah, I mean, the only difference between a safe and an unsafe programme is the presence of a skilled teacher or coach. So we'll discuss this in more detail in the next section. But as a fundamental ground rule, correct form should always come first before the addition of any load, speed or intensity. And again, it just brings us back to that, that pyramid that we were talking about earlier. I think I love the um, idea of the the things that people do and accept that are a part of the school day that are doing the complete opposite of what they're saying. You know what I mean? Like carrying yeah. books and sitting and like, you're right. It's amazing. I mean, I, I got, um, when I first started the program at, at, at BSK, the first thing I did was get pulled into the principal's office and was asked why, why students were picking up weights in their PE lesson. And I was like, can you define what you mean by the weight? And, the weight that was in discussion was actually a four kilogram kettlebell. Um, and I said, well, I picked up a kid's bag the other day and I know it weighed 15. And I was told that that was their problem to worry about that. 
and not that, not my problem. I says, well, it, it does become my problem when, you know, I'm teaching them to move safely with a lower weight and then all of a sudden they can then carry a school bag which is halfway down their back and it's, you know, in a poor position, they're walking poorly and it's nearly the same weight as them. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like the, the, the two sides of the coin. Um, it might be using weights in a classroom, but we're just trying to teach them to move, you know, effectively and well with it. Um, in order to support our belief that CrossFit is safe for school-aged children, which we've talked about already, um, we've sourced the following articles, which uh, um, compared the prevalence of injuries between running and CrossFit. So I'm sure you'll agree that as teachers or parents, we have no real hesitation in sending kids out for a run as part of a fitness program. Whilst realising the obvious benefits of running, I absolutely love running, it is an interesting to note that 1,000 hours of CrossFit, only 3.1 injuries occurred, in contrast to 12.1 after the same amount of time spent running. These are the types of articles that are useful to have as evidence to support your claims to your administration team when trying to implement it in your own schools. These pro CrossFit articles are not very popular and don't exist um, very often. However, um, you know, they are very good evidence. And again, we, if you need any help with putting this to your administration, we have a lot more evidence to, to back this up because it, again, this is conversations I've, I've had with my school, schools in the past. Yeah, as we touched on earlier, and as Jared's just mentioned, with, within our modern day life, there are many hidden dangers that easily go unnoticed throughout the school day and even in a child's home life. We don't want to labour the point, but time spent sitting, staring at screens, carrying heavy school bags, and coupled with a, a sugar heavy diet, all pose greater threats to long term health and well being. We're going to go ahead and look at the what you need to do section now. So, we're going to outline practical strategies that you can use to ensure safety within your CrossFit lessons. Moving on to strategy one, it is incredibly important to adhere to the mechanics, consistency, intensity principle. The rea reality is that without consistent form in any given movement, students should not be invited to add resistance or increase intensity. Um, the three strike rule is a strategy that has worked well at CrossFit BSK um, and in my current post in Almaty. It's very, very useful, for, particularly for kids uh, and boys, I find is the most useful. So if a student's performing a movement with incorrect form, like in the photo here, where the arch back and the deadlift, um, they're going to be given a first strike warning and basically be provided with the necessary teaching points or coaching points to try and help them move a little bit better and get into a better position. If the poor form continues, then any resistance that would have been present is removed. So in this guy's case, um, he's got a barbell. I would be stripping the weights off of that barbell and, and allow him just to move the barbell. In a student's case, we might be already at the empty barbell stage. I would replace that barbell with a PVC pipe, plastic PVC pipe. Uh, and I finally, if a student continues to apply poor form, then they're going to be asked to stop performing that movement completely uh, and replace it with an alternative movement um, so that they can compromise their safety. This is not to humili humiliate them at all, but rather ensure that they move well and move safely. So most of the time, in my experience, and I'm sure Scott was the same, is not many students reach strike three because strike one was enough to put them into a, a better position and allow them to move a little bit better. Another strategy that um, can be used is non-competitive lifting. So within adult CrossFit classes, we'll regularly perform one rep max lifts where we lift the most weight possible in a particular movement for one repetition. For students, however, we tend to work between three rep max and 10 rep max. This way, students have to focus on form over a number of repetitions and are less likely to try a weight that would cause a compromise in form, potentially leading to injury. Again, teachers and coaches play an important role in making students aware of their limitation. Some students overestimate their lifting ability, as I'm sure you know, and are influenced by peers to attempt weights that they're unable to perform safely. Teachers should have strict parameters set and instill an open and honest attitude in all their students. Students should be able to self-evaluate whether they perform the lift with correct form or not and know when and how to increase resistance safely. And finally, the use of CrossFit points as a motivational tool is something that has been particularly successful. The regular awarding of technique, effort and CrossFit star points has helped reinforce the values of honesty and consistency that we want to present in our students. Rewarding the student who demonstrates fantastic form consistently over the student who lifts more weight but cuts reps and sacrifices form is a really powerful message to send to your students. They will realise that effort and consistency of form irrelevant of ability level are all paramount to winning or lifting heavy and this will hopefully influence their future practice.
if you do have a student who is able to perform a movement consistently with correct mechanics, added resistance and increased intensity, then they may be awarded the CrossFit Star Award. Whilst always reinforcing student safety, we don't want to set limitations for those students who are able to safely add weight and intensity. Okay, we've been speaking long enough for you um, now. So let's get, break things up a little bit and get moving. So at the same time, we're going to introduce you to something that we call a Tabata break, a strategy that can be implemented almost instantly into any classroom situation. So this could be a really good one to give out to, um, to your kind of classroom teachers within the school. Um, so you might be wondering what Tabata is. It's essentially, it's a form of interval training. Only the intervals are very, very short. So you do 20 seconds of work with 10 seconds of rest. Uh, and these intervals are performed for four minutes in total, so meaning you perform eight cycles of whatever movement that you choose. The movements, however, we're going to vary them up. So as you can see, they're on the, um, they're on the, sorry, the slide right now. For the first 20 seconds, you do star jumps. The second 20 seconds, you do squats. Third 20 seconds, lunges, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to get yourself a little bit of space beside your desk, for some of you, I know it's still very, very early, um, but let's get ourselves moving. Um, Scott, are you ready? Yeah, I can certainly find. I've not got much space behind this desk, but I'm going to try my best as well. Same, I'm, I'm a bit restricted, but I'm going to, going to give I'm, it a go. I'm down in here too. Okay. Let's hope that my video works. Okay. We can see everyone else as well, in case. Um... Oh, two, one, star jumps. Let's go. Twenty seconds worth. I haven't taken my earphones out, so this might end in disaster. <laughs> Carl, you better be you better be doing this too. Okay, we're on a ten second rest. I'm doing it. You can tell I'm breathing heavy. I have got no space for squats here. I'm going to try my best. I don't know space. Either. Hope you can't hear my knee. My knees clicking. Old age, Carl. I didn't do a warm up. How did you embed that um, counter? Rest. <laughs> We're on. We'll do one more lunges. Oh, this could be intense. Oh, Jesus! Good, good. I hope my neighbours don't mind as well. That my <laughs> knees are crashing off the floor here. I'm definitely not doing the press ups. So that's going to have to be the retirement point. Okay. Right, right, right. We'll have a break there. <laughs> so, let me get my breath back. But hopefully, you enjoyed that little break from our voices and you didn't just sit in your seat. I hope you guys got involved. And um, with most of you being P teachers, I'm sure you're all super keen to get moving. <laughs> Either way, the benefits of this year's students are obvious. It's really great to break up, break up static lessons, allowing the students to move and get the blood flowing. And it's actually proven to improve um, cognition in your lessons and overall academic ability because I'm sure you all know that anyway. But most importantly, it's a really fun way to try and introduce the values of CrossFit into your whole school. Um, I would highly encourage you to give it a try. For guys who teach as well, certificated PE, I've done this before with my, in Scotland it's called S, S3 and S4 students, but basically students that are 15 and 16 taking examination PE and also you get classroom lessons with guys that don't want to be in the classroom. And this is a really fun way of trying to get the content of the work um, just to break up a little bit for them. Really, really good fun. Okay, look, um, before we talk a bit more about building CrossFit into the curriculum, we want to gain an insight into your current fitness blocks and how they are received by your students. So how do your students view fitness as an activity block in your PE curriculum? Would you say it's a block they particularly enjoy? Or do some students seem put off by the idea of fitness? I mean, now that you say that, ironically, I had this conversation just yesterday with a group of mine who I didn't actually, I couldn't take the lesson. It was meant to be fitness. And instead, they got volleyball with another teacher and they were absolutely delighted that they didn't have fitness. <laughs> so the, the attitude still in my, in some classes in my school is that, is that fitness is, is not a good thing. We okay, might bro. like fitness, that's good. Yeah, some both as well. 
Well, thanks for sharing that, guys. Um, I think we both feel that in the past, when running traditional fitness programs, students would, would certainly lose interest quite quickly, and we didn't feel like we were really inspiring the students to go ahead and pursue it in their life out of school. However, with CrossFit, we've, we've seen this having the, the complete opposite effect on our students, leaving them with a desire to learn more about the Olympic lifting technique or building strength, and they're actively seeking after-school opportunities to get more involved. And luckily, we were able to cater to these demands, and it's something that we'll touch on um, in the last section of the webinar. Okay, so we're now going to get into the kind of the really good stuff and, and hopefully stuff that you can take away um, from this webinar. Um, Basically, we're going to share some of our experiences that we've had in, in, in the schools and, and hopefully, like I say, give you some ideas of what we could, could maybe do yourself. In order to help do this, so I'm going to give a little bit of background um, to, to CrossFit BSK uh, and how it first started. So this was my first ever CrossFit project, um, having be myself become solely influenced by CrossFit training in my own strength and conditioning practice, I decided to give it some airtime and PE lessons. After I got my CrossFit Level 1 qualification, I decided to run a year-long elective program with my year 11 class. So that's maybe like a group of 15 and 16-year-old students. I had 16 student volunteers sign up and their one lesson of PE a week was always CrossFit for the entire year, whereas other students in the year group had their you know, standard rotation of game style activities. So maybe six weeks of basketball, football, swimming, volleyball, etc. cetera. Um, the experiment proved to be so successful that I convinced the powers that be within my school to make us official. Um, when I returned the following summer after my lovely 10-week holiday, we had two full-time coaches, the fantastic Andy and Shia. I know Shia won't be listening, but Andy might be, um, and I hope he is because he's still very much the heartbeat of the program now, uh, and we were fully affiliated. Um, and yes, the main thing was we had absolutely loads of equipment. Um, I'd gone from having six kettlebells, some PVC pipes, and a handful of dumbbells to almost anything you could possibly want in a gym. This does make programming a lot easier and planning um, and also selling the class to senior boys, but I'll get on to it, it is not essential. So in terms of the pros and cons of the program at BSK, well, the pros are definitely the incredible equipment available that Callum's just touched on. Also, the addition of coaches who supplement the teaching staff for that class. So, for example, with my current year 11 class on CrossFit, I would be the teacher, but would also have two coaches who would lead or assist in the lesson as needed. Furthermore, it is a unique audience. We've broken down so many barriers, especially in the concept of single gender PE classes. In our senior groups, we have mixed CrossFit classes, which have proven to be popular and beneficial to both genders. This was a huge step. Also, from the perspective of teaching staff, there are something like 300 staff in the school. It provides a convenient place to train. Again, where classes are mixed gender, when all other gyms in the country are single gender. For the expat community, this is pretty significant. The cons of the program, well, in QA, is the heat. The gym is currently placed in a covered hall, therefore in the summer, the heat can sometimes just be unbearable. There was industrial AC units, but they generally circulated hot air. Also, the space is not exclusive to the CrossFit gyms. It is a multi-purpose multi space that needs to be used by PE classes, break times for primary students in the school, etc., etc. So staff have had to be very clever with covering and protecting equipment from these situations. And just while I remember, um, actually, I, the reason I put this photo up, um, this guy here, um, and I see I'm, I'm, I've not seen him now in probably six months because obviously I've left, but this is um, Mohammed OG Mo because he was the very first student that signed up for the after school program. Uh, and the top photo is obviously him when he first did. And the bottom photo is him, I think, about 12 to 14 months later. And the, the transformation in just this one student has been absolutely incredible. And he doesn't mind me talking about him like this because he was a very shy student who didn't enjoy PE very much, was very much not um, a team sports player. And this basically provided him something that he could do and be really successful. And he's probably one of the stronger athletes that we have um, in the gym. And as you can see, it's no coincidence that the, the weight that he has above his shoulders here is, I mean, pretty much three times what it was 12 months before. So he's a real kind of the pinnacle of, of what we try and do within the program. Um, and now CrossFit Halebrae Almaty. Um, I hope to be able to say in this webinar that it was all confirmed and official, um, but I'm still going through some very minor admin procedures to ensure everything is above board. But basically before the end of this month, um, we will have official confirmation 
and be the only affiliated school um, in Kazakhstan and I would imagine probably across most of Central Asia. Um, the main things that I've tried to implement, apart from obviously official cross affiliation, is first of all creating a legitimate um, space for fitness lessons to take place. The photos you, here you can see are my fitness suite, um, and it's this is the new look fitness suite. Basically, when I got there, um, it was filled with treadmills, cross trainers, and a stationary bike. Um, after some manual labour to relocate this equipment. Um, mm -hmm. The this is a space that we're left with, and it, it's you know the pallet's quite small um, and quite a low roof, quite warm. It is absolutely fantastic for what we've needed it for. Um, it's been hugely beneficial, especially with the intense winters that we have here. It's minus fifteen today. Obviously, that eliminates the the opportunity to go out on the astro turf and do anything outside. We only have one sports hall, sometimes four PE classes at the same time. So this has given us another option um, in which to do a, you know a real PE lesson and we've had students as young as year two in this room uh, and still provided sound PE lessons and previously the only people that used this room were senior students on their elective PE lessons and in my honest opinion they weren't very beneficial there was guys kind of going through the motions on a treadmill for 30 minutes and then leaving the lesson that for me was not um, you know an experience that I wanted to repeat so um, we've also started a staff program um, originally we started with six um, and just once a week, but now we're up to 17 members on a weekly basis. Um, and also the headmaster just at lunch yesterday promised me that he will attend next week. So that would be very big and positive indeed. Um, my advice in terms of building things into a curriculum would be, as per the top line in the slide here, is pick movements that allow all in the class to access them through the scaling options that we talked about earlier. So search the internet. There are loads of options to allow all of your students to achieve a squat, a lunge, a push-up, a pull-up, if you've got the equipment, by the end of a lesson. While it might not be the full movement itself, it will certainly be progression for that student, which is obviously so important within PE lessons. In an ideal world, equipment does make your life a lot easier, but it's not essential. The weight of the body can often be enough to provide resistance for most movements for both children and adults. Um, I've run both styles of programming, sorry, both styles of um, yeah, programs where I've had the equipment and had none. I obviously prefer the luxury of equipment. It makes my life easier, but I can still run a meaningful and beneficial program with just a handful of items. Um, avoid just creating circuit training for six weeks. Um, kids get bored very, very quickly and can work out that you're ultimately repeating the same thing, but just changing, changing the movements. So the, um, the final bit of advice. The scaling thing would be, like what they made me do when I couldn't do pull-ups and I was uh, doing these alternate things. Yes. <laughs> I had some success though. Oh, yeah. you were doing the ring rows, weren't you? Yes, I'm remembering actually what you were doing. <laughs> when Jared came to work out with me in Kuwait um, after one of his seminars, we took him through a little workout, but rather than put him through pull-ups, um, especially given scaling. he was a There was some scaling going on. We scaled and, and he did some ring rows instead and still got the effect of the workout that I wanted him to have. <laughs> um, we've also got um, some advice here on just getting creative and getting equipment through the means that you already have in your, in your P department. So here's some examples of things that I've done before. This is not actually any of my kids, but this is examples of equipment I have used. Um, tires are one of my absolute favorites. Um, I still actually haven't got enough of them here, but the you know, I will be able to get a bit more use of them when the, when the weather gets a bit better. And they're pretty easy to source and either free or cheap. You've got a scrap heap and guys are generally happy to get rid of them. Um, sandbags are another fantastic option because, again, they're cheap and you can make your own. Um, buddy carries, so i.e. carrying a person in your group. Again, not applicable to all people in your PE class. I am aware of health and safety requirements. Um, I know maybe some students are bigger than others, but again, it just gives you an idea of you, you can create resistance or load with what you already have. And finally, the plate push. Um, there's a sure there's something in your PE cupboard that can replicate this kind of movement. Um, for example, the other day I used the rugby pads. We don't actually play rugby here, so I don't understand why there is rugby pads. But I made use of them by doing it as a as a heavy object carry uh, with my senior boys, and they absolutely loved it. It was heavy and awkward enough. Um, for them to be challenged um, and I say it was the most use they've probably had in years because we don't actually play rugby here. 
Okay, we are going to go through two example CrossFit lessons now. Uh, one for the primary age students from years one to six and the other for secondary. So I'm going to start with the primary uh, age lesson. When introducing CrossFit to primary students, especially younger age groups between year one and year three, it's extremely important to make things fun. Focusing on one or two basic skills, introducing the key teaching points, and then reinforcing these through fun games is certainly the best approach to maximize student engagement. For example, with a lesson focusing on the burpee movement, you would start by going through the five main teaching points that the students need to remember. So standing with the feet shoulder width apart, pushing the hips back, dropping both the hips and the chest to the floor, jumping with both feet forward towards the hands, and then finally finishing with a jump and a clap. So coupling this with a demonstration from the teacher and possibly using a Simon Says style game is a good way to ensure that students are remembering the points. Younger students could then progress onto a fun game, such as Farmers and Lumberjacks, um, where students are split into two teams. One who tries to knock over as many cones as possible, the Lumberjacks, and the other who attempts to stand the cones upright, the Farmers. At the end of the game, the team who has the least will have to perform a fun punishment of five to ten perfect burpees, which would be closely supervised by the teacher at the site. For those students in year four to six, they may be able to be progressed onto an actual workout, such as the one shown on the slide, where students work in pairs to complete as many rounds as possible in eight minutes of five meter bear crawl, five burpees, followed by a five meter bear crawl back to the partner. An element of competition can be introduced at this stage, but only if students adhere to the mechanics, consistency and intensity principle that we touched on earlier. At the end of the lesson, the CrossFit points would be awarded to deserving students and teachers can log this in their planners or through apps such as Class Dojo, which the younger students seem to respond especially well to. Um, I'm just going to talk about a secondary lesson here, but just very briefly because Scott's obviously mentioned it and I've got it in my workout as well. And it links back to what Will said earlier about an AMRAP. So AMRAP is as many rounds as, or repetitions as possible. And the reason that we try and always do make the workout an AMRAP rather than four times. So by that, I mean, let's do 100 squats for time. Obviously, some kids are going to finish faster than others. And the reason that an AMRAP is obviously so good is that irrelevant of how good or bad a student is at these particular movements, they're all going to be working for the same length of time. So that you know, there's nobody left out. Nobody technically knows how far other people have got through the workout. And there's no kind of, um, you know, separation within your group and it also makes your planning a lot easier you know exactly the length of time that certain things will take and um, rather than worrying about the kid who finishes after two minutes and is therefore standing waiting for the next task in the lesson um, so yeah in secondary we want to promote fun but at the same time we want to start shaping these young teens into a strength and conditioning program that kind of seems to be quite close to what an adult might be doing um, in this short example, we have a fo the focus movement is an air squat, obviously, which is, I touched on earlier. Um, now we're moving towards seeing students who may not have taken part in a lot of physical activity being able to struggle with this. So we talked about it before, this issue of mobility in their hips particularly. Some of them might not be able to squat down as well as the younger students. Younger kids, <laughs> I don't know what it is, but the little guys, when you ask them to do a squat, can nearly always um, get down at the bottom of a squat and not even... You don't have to bore them with the teaching points. They can just do it. The older guys, um, they've been sitting down a lot longer in their lives and their hips are a bit tighter. Um, and they there for something struggle to get into that position. Um, more time is spent on the technicality of the movement. Uh, but a really simple and effective workout that's good for a teenage group is a pair workout uh, in, a, in a you go, I go format. So for example, if I was with Scott, very simple. I do 10 squats. He does 10 squats. I do 10. He does 10. And we keep going for as many times as we can in three minutes. Um, and again, you could pair up people who are of similar ability in the same group so that they are working and challenging each other. Um, and the other beauty of this pair workout is that you can have one student almost being the coach in the rest period. So, um, and therefore, it's really good, especially if you allow this CrossFit points system to be on the line. Um, the rewards for the CrossFit points or the, the CrossFit star within your lesson, it depends on your school. When I was at, in Kuwait, it might have been a house point, which was quite you know, a competitive thing within the class. In my current school, it might be a blue card, which again is interlinked to our house points. Stickers for younger kids are obviously absolutely fantastic. They absolutely love a sticker. Um, and I made some team awesome certificates the other day 
um, which took me five minutes to make on Canva. Um, and the kids absolutely loved them as well. Um, even in secondary, the older kids, I always try and finish with a game, something a little bit fun um, to come away from the workout, but it still is interlinked to the workout. Um, in this example, I've shared my ace card, which I actually haven't played in a long time, but it is absolutely fantastic. It's called Quidgefall, um, and I'm going to have to give big credits to Andy, our CrossFit BSK coach for this one. It definitely grew arms and legs from the original, um, but if you sell it with passion, the kids will, will love it. Um, it's a hybrid of dodgeball, hula hut throwdown, which I thank the PE specialist on Twitter for, uh, and Quidditch, for those who've watched Harry Potter. Um, two teams, lots of hoops, two football goals, and lots of balls, one of which has to be a unique color, ideally yellow, because it represents the golden snitch. There's loads of sub-rules and layers which you can build into the game, but the golden snitch is ultimately the one that's the key. And if it's thrown into the game by the teacher at any point when it's going on, um, and it's thrown into a goal by the opposition team, then the game is over, and all the other bits in between kind of finish. Um, so much fun. I literally played it at the end of my last um, term with my CrossFit group in year 10, like 16-year-olds, absolutely loving it. Um, I never thought it would be so popular. So that's a summary of the rules that we made, but there's so many variations that you can make make within that. You'll be pleased to know Calum is still going strong at BSK. Good. And still sells it. It's a fan's favourite with all the year 10. <laughs> Good. Okay, and we're going to look at after school CrossFit now. So the, the beauty of running a successful curricular CrossFit programme is that students will be so eager to get more access to CrossFit in an after school setting. This provides a unique opportunity for those students who wouldn't normally feature in school sport teams to get active out with school time. In our experience, the biggest success stories have been those students who would struggle with the traditional team sports found within the PE curriculum. When introduced to CrossFit, they simply fl flourished. Students are able to be introduced to more complex aspects of CrossFit within an ex extracurricular setting. It's possible to cover the more technically demanding movements in detail and spend the necessary time working through the scaling options for the particular focus of the unit, whether it be Olympic lifting, gymnastics, or metabolic conditioning. As students progress, tracking their progress over time, it won't be long before they're eager to compete against others. There are opportunities for inter-school competitions to be arranged, as well as branching out to local schools. For example, the coaches at BSK are currently trying to set up local schools fitness competition, including a Spartan style sprint where students are able to put their functional fitness to the test. It's also worth mentioning that with increased fitness, naturally students will be able to apply this to other school sports. So students who never previously had the confidence to trial for teams now have a newfound belief from their increased fitness levels and are well prepared to contribute to other areas of school sport. Okay, so as we begin to draw the webinar to a close, we hope that you feel prepared to go away and get the CrossFit ball rolling or any other strength and conditioning um, methodology for that matter. Um, however, we understand that you may want to develop your knowledge a little bit further uh, and build on the base that we've hopefully provided for you today. With this in mind, we provided some further learning opportunities that you may be interested in pursuing. The CrossFit Level 1 course would certainly be an ideal place to start your development as a CrossFit teacher or coach. This course takes you through all the fundamental movements, really picking away at how you move. It will also show you how to provide your students with appropriate scaled options and cues to ensure mechanics are sound. Finally, it will begin to look at basic programming and nutritional information. This course is a first stop for all CrossFit athletes, uh, sorry, coaches. From here, you can progress to level two or begin to specialize in a particular area such as gymnastics or endurance. But as we are all teachers, mainly teachers here, we would class this as the best fit course for you. I have highlighted some of the online courses as they can be done whenever you want and are, are normally more accessible cost-wise, especially the spot, the flaw and scaling as these will help you identify what goes wrong in movements and how you can help the students to make them slightly easier. Um, another really good course, and again, online, is Brand X Method, um, and it's another, uh, like I say, online CPD. Uh, the owner of this um, particular group is actually the original founder of CrossFit Kids, so there's a lot of overlap between the two, and the one major benefit of this is that this can be done online, whereas the CrossFit Kids, you actually have to do a weekend course in person. Um, 
I've just done the basic course on this and I'm waiting to do the advanced one in the next, over the next couple of months when I can find some free time within um, my schedule. But again, really, really interesting for your practice um, if you can, you can finance it. And the final suggestion is just talk to us. Um, we led a very similar course for, for Connected PE back in Dubai in October uh, and we gave access to our Google Drive folder. Um, and if this interests you, then either drop me an email or give Scott or me a drop a line on, on Twitter and we'll give you the access required. It basically just provides some ideas and thoughts on how to get this program up and running at your school, as well as some advice and really good reading articles, evidence to support it. The most important thing is there's lesson plans, there's curriculums in there, um, so lots of useful things that, again, maybe people could add to it if they, if they found that they'd found things that were successful in their school. Now, we're, we're about to finish and, and show your video, but before we do that, I noticed that a question and answer popped up. I'm not sure if you've seen that in your account from Will. Uh, I feel this is probably a good time to touch on this before we finish. So Will asked, how would you work a lesson slash competition where half the students have good technique and the others don't? So I'll go ahead and kind of say my part and then possibly hand you over to Callum. I think the beauty of um, the, the CrossFit program we run is that we have coaches, as we touched on earlier. Um, what we would normally do is, if we have three, we'll split it into three groups. So we'll have an A, B, and a C group. The A group will be challenged and pushed on, possibly adding intensity and weight. The Bs will just focus on reinforcing mechanics, and the Cs, that's when we'll build the scaling options that we talked about earlier. If you don't have the luxury of having two additional teachers to help you, I think that's where you just need to be clever in terms of your prep. Make sure that you have the necessary equipment there to kind of help with if you're covering squat you know, go and get yourself some chairs and they're there and they're ready for students that are not able to perform it um, with correct mechanics. I don't know if you've got anything possibly to add to that, Cal. No, I think that's probably, I think that's oh. covered. I think I'd be repeating you if I was to yeah. add to that, yeah. Right, well, as we're, we're drawn to a close, we're going to show you a section of this video at another school we have implemented CrossFit. I think it's a, an American school and it's not just into PE, but whole school now. As you can see in the slides here, we're going to award you medals. We'll send the medals in the post, I promise. Um, <laughs> if you can hold this kind of reverse crab position, you'll get a bronze. If you can hold the plank position, you will get a silver. And if you can hold a squat, you will get a gold. And I think, luckily for you guys, we're not going to have time to watch the full video, which I think is about 12 to 15 minutes long. But please feel free to finish it off afterwards. It is a really interesting watch. Right, let me get it loaded here. We'll probably watch the first... Uh, I'm waiting the time, so let's go with it at least two minutes. They don't realize how hard they're working. It's just part of what they do. One of the most important things that CrossFit does is it builds confidence in a, in a middle school or in an adolescent and a young adult who is really just trying to figure out who they are. We believe in getting the kids out of their seats. We believe in getting the kids to think creatively, to uh, learn to be learners, to learn to be thinkers, so that no matter what the curriculum is, no matter what the, the problem is, they have the strategies in place to, to tackle anything, and they have the self-confidence to tackle it. Welcome to I think one of the things that, that has really stuck out with me about this whole CrossFit concept and the whole Move and Break concept and everything that, that Crystal has brought to, to Heartland is that the kids take such pride and such ownership in what they're doing. My name is Peter Driscoll. I'm the kindergarten through eighth and adapted physical education teacher here at Heartland Elementary School. I'm also an L1 CrossFit trainer. HAS CrossFit is located right here in the Cape Ray School Building. What was once a kindergarten classroom converted into this doubles as our CrossFit and Brain Fit room, as well as a hockey stick and push push. We call it the Brain Fit room because students are learning that when they move, they're actually making their brains stronger and healthier. So students are given the opportunity to come down here and take movement breaks. They also uh, 
I got into an offshore courses, also a reward program where kids on different plans have to every year earn certain rewards. So I just got in there, uh, exercise with them, and create their own workout for kids on offshore courses. Instead of getting a candy bar or a pizza, our students now are getting a chance to invite their friends down and exercise with them as they're working out. So that really supports the healthy TV programs versus running around. During the school day, this is also our foster room where our middle schoolers come in and do foster workouts multiple times a week during the elective period during recess. And teachers and students work out together in this space after school, just a couple days a week, and they're just doing it by themselves and doing it with their students and peers. Okay, we'll pause it there just because I'm wary of the time. But yeah, that is, I'll leave it up on the slide. That is the video. I would highly recommend watching the full way through. It's really, really good. Um, and it's just a great example of what can happen when the right people push the program and have audience who will embrace it. Bear in mind, this room that, that, that they're showing here was formerly a kindergarten room. So it was designed as a classroom. And with a little bit of creativity, they've created, um, created a gym within that space. And it's a really good story. So I would highly encourage that you watch it through. Oh. Um, and with that video, that actually finishes our webinar for today. Once again, can we thank you all for tuning in. It was absolutely fantastic to be given this opportunity to present again. And from both Scott and I, a big, big thank you. Big props to Jared, obviously, as well, for having us and all his work he's doing at Connected PE. And let's hope that we can be back next time to share some more developments and ideas. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your weekend, guys. Awesome. Absolutely. Um, stellar stuff, guys. I, I mean, uh, just being able to see um, sort of the justification of it um, makes it so much more powerful. Uh, that that whole argument of being hypocritical because, you know, all, of all the movements that we sort of get them to do without really the thought behind it, like running, that's mm -hmm. insane. That's insane, isn't it? What, what was that data again? What, from that um, I think it was 12.1 12, 12 compared to over 1,000 hours. Compared to 3.1 per like course. If you said teacher just walks out and says, off you go, without any yeah. sort of thought, thought about it. But, you know, the minute someone suggests a movement that could you know, actually benefit their life, it's like they become research scientists and yep. put up a, a, a wall. Uh, I, I think it's brilliant. So amazing stuff. Um, I also like what you mentioned about the, the people who aren't getting engaged necessarily in the traditional after school program. Um, yeah, something for them too. So, I mean, did you notice that that happened a bit as well? It was huge at BSK when I was there because it's such a big school. We made 3,000, well, they do still have 3,000 kids and I'm sure Scott can back me up on that now, but 3,000 kids and obviously not all of them can make the team. Like the under 13 football team, you get 80 kids showing up to the trial and you pick a squad of 15. What happens mm. to the other 65 kids? Well, that's them for three months. We can't, we didn't have anywhere else to put them we didn't have the staff to, to give them an after-school program. And these kids just kind of filtered in to the CrossFit program because they had nothing else to go to. And maybe football, they obviously weren't fantastic at it, but it didn't mean that they weren't keen on, on sport and, and PE in general. And then they, they, they found something that they, were, that they were good at because ultimately you can make everybody good at CrossFit in its own little way. And they see progression quicker maybe than, than in other things. Um, you know, like some of you will understand that if a guy is not great at football, no matter how good a teacher you are, you're not going to make him unbelievable at football. But in CrossFit, you can really see the progressions a lot quicker because it's, it's, a, it's a movement pattern usually rather than a natural ability. Yeah, yeah. A bit of scaling in there and um, you got some success out of me um, <laughs> in that session for sure. So, no, I love it, guys. Really appreciate it. If you do have any questions, um, fire them away. Um, on, on Twitter or email or any of those sort of platforms is probably best, yeah? Yep, absolutely. Twitter is probably the best. That's our handles just on screen there, so we can oh, get back to you if any. Absolutely. Go ahead and do that. Uh, I know Will was um, and a couple of people talking about that they need to go and refurbish their fitness center. Um, and, I mean, I think that's – there's probably so many schools that have these fitness centers set up and they're maybe underutilized because they serve these very fixed movement patterns. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. My, my advice would be – you don't probably need to redesign it. You just probably need to get rid of a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How simple it can be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just thinking like, I remember we went, put in a grant proposal to get a lot of stuff like treadmills and, and things. And, 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 and based on that, we just were so limited. Um, but we spent a fortune 
um, on it. And I mean, it would have been a far better approach to, to take the approach that you guys took, uh, which was amazing. Awesome. Thanks again.